right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast powered by our friends over at X2 Power Batteries. As always, I'm your host, Bailey Eichbrett, and unfortunately for another show here, Andy's still under the weather, uh, so it's just me rocking tonight with our guest, Mr. Taylor Watkins, who's hot off another win uh, on the MPFL, which we're going to talk about a bunch tonight. Uh, but unfortunately, again, no Andy, no captain. We are captainless tonight, and... Uh, but he was able to get the new Lure Lab show up and prepared for Saturday. Uh, you might hear his inhaler going in the background, but he he uh, he toughened up and he uh, he got the show done. And uh, it's a really good Lure Lab show coming up this weekend. We're changing some things up with the with the Lure Lab just in terms of who's going to be on it, just because the three of us to try to be on three different shows all the time. It's kind of crazy. So Andy's leading the charge for Lure Lab. Uh, rightfully so, because he is the tackle tinkerer amongst the three of us, us hosts and folk at the Serious Angler uh, Podcast Network. So look forward to that on Saturday. That episode is going to drop. If you haven't checked out Lure Lab and the social media as well for Lure Lab, all the links are down in the show description. It'll be in every show description if you guys want to check them out. It doesn't matter if you click on this episode or not. Um, but I highly encourage you to go check that out. All about bait tinkering, very bait specific, technique specific. Uh, so very down Andy's lane and hopefully Andy can uh, can rest up and get back on here on the show here soon. But not that the, the weather conditions are going to help him at any out at all. I just walked outside. We probably have an inch of snow right now and we're predicted here in Buffalo to have a basically another snow Mageddon, I think, as, as people call it here. Uh, we're predicted to have four to six feet of snow this weekend. And yes, I said feet, not inches, feet. Um, and my psycho, but it decided, Hey, it would be kind of fun to go fishing that. So I'm taking the Hobie out tomorrow and going to try to go fish in four feet of snow. I might go sledding in the Hobie down the ramp to the lake. I don't know. We're going to try to film a, a YouTube video on it and you'll see that on be the fish, which by the way, the first, uh, well, the first of the last remaining chasing hardware episodes for 2022 from Hobie TOC. Just dropped last night. So if you guys want to check that out, link down below. Um, as well as be on the lookout, um, whether on this show and in our intros, we'll try to let you guys know about them, but also on the social media. Uh, all of our partners, if they're having a Black Friday sale where you guys can save money on the products, we're going to let you guys know. That way you guys can save some money on some top-notch stuff. Uh, just be on the lookout for that. But I think without further ado, I think that's all I have for notes tonight. Um uh, I will say next week's shows, we're going to be doing a dual live stream with Kevin Baxter, uh, the bait man on Tuesday. We're going to be doing a Thanksgiving show. You guys like the Halloween ones. So we're going to do a Thanksgiving version next week on Tuesday night. And then Friday's episode is going to be uh, co-hosted with Drew Gregory. He's coming back on and we're going to have on Cody Milton, the angler of the year from the Holy BOS series. Cody's a day hammer. So I'm excited for that one. That'll be next Friday, but without further ado, let's bring on the hammer for tonight. Mr. Taylor Watkins, what's going on, man? What's up? How are you? I'm doing all right, dude. I, I if, if for some reason this connection just drops, it's because there's 10 feet of snow on our power lines outside. But yeah, other than that, we're good. <laughs> I, I don't wish that on anybody. I, I've been in Southern Illinois and it's been like 16 degrees every morning and I'm like a wimp. I'm like, oh, it's so cold. I don't like it. <laughs> See, if you take the wind out of the equation, I love the cold. But once it starts getting windy, oh. man, like when it's below like 50 degrees, like wind sucks. Yeah. Say, it, I mean, I love it, snow, though. I'll say it. it. It was like that yesterday. I saw my first, uh, I called it a, a pop-up snow shower. Like The sun was shining. The wind was blowing like 30. And all of a sudden, it just started snowing. And there was like one cloud in the sky. I'm like, this is like an Alabama afternoon when it's just like a pop-up rainstorm. This is a pop-up snowstorm. <laughs> it was wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's different up here in the North. Whereas like we'll get these storms like this weekend where it'll start snowing tonight and it won't end until like next Monday. Like it'll just go straight. <laughs> no. Wild. Yeah. I'll stay. I'll stick to Tennessee. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. I mean, I don't know if it's the Northerner in me, but there's something peaceful, like when it's not windy, of course, when it's cold and it's snowing and you're fishing, especially, I mean, obviously when you're smoking them, that's better. I mean, small mouth loves snow, but like, 
I don't know. I love that. There's something about that because everybody else is probably in the deer stand and you got the lake to yourself or it might seem like it because all you can see is snow in front of you. But it's uh, it's fun. Tomorrow's going to be interesting. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the Hobie out, but I'm trying. I might be a little psychotic, but we're gonna try. <laughs> we got to try, right? I'll, I'll watch from the window and cheer you on. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Oh, it's going to be interesting. We might be sledding with the truck and then sledding with the yak to get it on the ramp, but we'll, we're going to make it happen. But, but dude, uh, it's good to get you on this show. And, uh, you know, for the first time, I'm getting really to talk to you on this platform. Uh, really, you know, tell folks, you know, one, uh, a little bit about you, but then two, where you got your start to begin with in bass fishing and who got you into it to begin with. Um, so to begin with, uh, to be completely honest, I don't even remember catching my first fish. That's how young I was. Love so, uh, my, I, from what I'm told, my grandpa took me to a pond and, uh, I caught my first catfish wherever I was like two or three. So, uh, I, you know, I grew up fishing my entire life. My mom and stepdad would come and pick me up at school during the, you know, like wherever it started getting warmer or August, where we went back to school. And they would take me and my brother. We had an old Procraft and it had like a little bitty front deck and this big giant floor and then the back deck. Well, they would take our sleeping bags and uh, we would fish until dark. Uh, we would get up there about five o'clock in the afternoon or something. They would let us fish till about dark. Then they would put me and my brother down in the sleeping bags down in the bottom of the pro craft and they would, they would fish all night. And then where we woke up, you know, where the sun started coming up, we would wake up and they'd let us fish for about an hour and then we'd go home. So, uh, man, I, I literally grew up on the lake, you know, uh, it was just, that's what we did. That's what we did as a family. And, uh, you know, the, the passion for fishing has always been there, but the passion to push on to the next level, I would say, I mean, wherever I was 18, 19, 20, I didn't, I didn't know how, I didn't know what to do or how to do it. Or, you know, I didn't know you went and fished the Bassmaster Opens to become a professional angler. Like I didn't know how it worked. And, uh, you know, once I started learning some of those things and then progressing in life and all that and uh, started making a little bit of money where I could afford to go fish some tournaments uh, at a higher level. I started doing that and uh, got my teeth kicked in for a few years, you know, just just started at the local level, started doing pretty decent, moved up, got beat, uh, started making some top 20s, top 10s, moved up, got beat. Uh, you know, BFLs, uh, Toyota series, which used to be Costas. And then I eventually got the invite to go to the MPFL. And I don't know, man, I, I lived in North Alabama till I was, uh, 25 years old. And then I moved to, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, where I was like 26. And so for the past, uh, seven years I've been, uh, in Knoxville. And I think moving to Knoxville was like what finally pushed me over the top. So I, I understood the lakes around North Alabama and the Coosa river and stuff like that. But whenever I went to Knoxville and I started, uh, fishing Cherokee and fishing for smallmouth and, uh, Norris and Douglas and, uh, throwing deep crankbaits and, you know, just doing all these different things that's whenever it all finally just meshed and came together. And then, you know, of course the MPFL came along and, and, and it's just, it's worked, man. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's just one of those things where it's just, uh, everything's coming together right now. Uh-oh. Of course I forgot to, uh, unmute myself <laughs> i was about to say well, I, you're talking but i don't hear anything i know that's my bad um my when my fiance is either cooking or something we have like her cat goes freaking nuts sometimes and i i try to mute myself when i'm not talking so you don't hear anything in the background but then of course with my forgetful memory i always leave myself on mute but uh this is this is part of the the show especially when we have new folks on that i love the most is hearing the different backgrounds the different upbringings and the routes into where you guys are at because I mean, across the board, when people think, especially that 
aren't as in, involved or attached to this industry. They assume every fisherman's got the same story, which I think to, to a majority that a lot of people are very similar, but it's cool to see some different unique upbringings and routes into it. I mean, I think one of my favorite stories is, is like Manny Wong. I mean, dude, that's, that's a super cool story, dude, from Hawaii. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's super cool, dude. Uh, and I, I'd love to, and I can't wait to dive into how you got so dang consistent. Um, and that's with, you know, we could, we could hop right into it uh, in terms of your win on Kissimmee. I mean, let's start, let's, let's start at the very, very beginning. So Florida, I think to people that don't live in Florida, like maybe the, you could make an exception of the talk of people from Minnesota would understand Florida because there's some lakes that are just grass fields, but um, Florida's daunting to a lot of people because you show up and it's all it is, is grass. Um, what kind of research are you doing or preliminary study are you doing before you're even getting down there for a lake like that? So this one was kind of tough I, I, because there has n- not, there's, there's never been a national tournament in Florida in November. I mean, th- I thought that was an odd timing when they released the schedule and I was actually excited for it. Yeah. And, and I was too, I was, I was a little worried, but optimistic. And, and this is why. So I actually had the opportunity, uh, when, after I moved to Tennessee, like I was talking about, uh, me and, uh, the fishing partner that I had, uh, in Tennessee, we qualified for, uh, the Bassmaster team championship, uh, on Harris in the first week of December. And this was four years ago, five years ago. And actually, uh, Matt Robertson, won that tournament and Matt won it on a shell bar throwing a deep crankbait and throwing a big swim bait, just like the Tennessee river. I mean, he, he attacked it just like the Tennessee river and went and graft and found shell bars. So I remembered that. <coughs> so that was obviously one of my plans was, Hey, let's look for some shell bars. Uh, and, and idle around. And, and that was kind of one of the game plans that I had. Another thing was uh, MLF had a heavy hitters event there in the summer, during the summer. And I did some research on it, and uh, Jordan Lee won that tournament. Uh, He had found a brush pile on Toho, and he could just kind of cycle through that brush pile, and he would get a bite just about every time he hit that brush pile. But there were several guys in the top ten that were uh, fishing current. And running up in the rivers, uh, Zach Burge was one of them. Um, uh, Skeet Reese was one of them. Uh, there was a few of them that were doing that. <coughs> so uh, that was kind of my one-two punch for practice, I guess. Uh, that was the first thing. That was how practice started. I started off looking for the current because we had had the hurricane uh, just a little bit before right. that. So I kind of had in my mind that, uh, yeah, there's probably going to be a lot of current. Um, but I got there and found out quickly that <laughs> there was only a couple of places that had current and I fished them and, and it was okay, but it definitely wasn't something that I felt like could last for three days and, and do well in the tournament. Um, so I kind of progressed through that and then, uh, started looking offshore uh, this is all during day one of practice, and I started on Lake Toho. And uh, I started looking offshore, and I caught one three-pounder in the hydrilla offshore. And I kind of, you know, I, I kind of sampled shallow as well. Like, And I say shallow is a relative term. I, I guess your typical Florida deal where you kind of go back in the pads or back in the reeds or back in the Kissimmee grass. And you could get a couple of bites doing that, but it was just, you could tell that they were resident fish. They were just really dark, really, you know, like they just live there. (coughs) And so then again, you know, I'm like, this is not going to pan out for three days. Uh, You might have a decent bag, uh, maybe cut a check. (coughs) So progressing into day two of practice, I went down to uh, Kissimmee and started looking around down there just fishing free 
just kind of letting my gut lead me to where, you know, just kind of riding the lake. And if I saw something that looked right, I would stop and then I would graph and idle and all that stuff. And, uh, I actually ran through the area that I ended up winning the tournament on at about 10 o'clock that morning. I actually was on pad driving and whenever I, I, it it was, there's an island. It was down there. There was an island and you could go through like a little cut through behind the island. Whenever I got to it, I was like, man, this, this looks good. Like that looks good. There's probably some shell bars out there in front of this little, you know, where it kind of necks down. And I bet you there's some current probably coming through there. Some windblown current, uh, or, you know, just regular lake current coming through there. It was a perfect pre-spawn area where fish could pull in from the lake and stop mm-hmm. and then push in behind the island and spawn. So in Florida, <coughs> unlike where we live, uh, where we live, the water has to warm for the fish to spawn. Well, in Florida, the water has to cool for them to spawn. So they start spawning in December. So we were right there at the pre-spawn area, even though it was November and it's fall everywhere else, we were pre-spawn getting ready for those fish to feed up and pull up and start spawning uh, yeah. for the winter. <coughs> I'm sorry, dude. I still got this cough, but <laughs> you're good. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I, I went through that area on pad and it, and it was just one of those things that I was just like, man, that, I need to check that, you know, I need to spend a little bit of time out there and look at that area. It just looked right to me for some reason. So I went in about a half a mile and I stopped and I'm like, I'm just going to stop right here. Like this, this area looks good to me. I'm just going to stop. And so I stopped and put the trawler down and I made a cast. And whenever I made a cast, I spooked a big fish wherever my bait hit the water. And I'm like, Oh, okay. That's promising. I made about three more casts and I caught a short fish. I'm like, okay, like that's two, you know, pretty quick. That's, that's good. This is probably a good area. There's some fish in this area. Well, about that time, there was a little uh, horseshoe of uh, lily pads there and fish started schooling in that little horseshoe. And uh, I picked up a top water, threw it over there. I twitched about twice and like a three and a half pounder ate it. And so I was like, man, uh, this is a really good area. And I put the, I put my power poles down and I just started watching. And I, I just kind of started looking around, watching the fish would come up in school and then they would stop and then they'd come up in school again. And I got over there and I started live scoping and I could see them all. And, and it was a shell bar inside of the, the lily pads. Interesting. <laughs> so, I, yeah. So after I, I, I found that, I'm like, I really got to go out here and check this place now. You know, like that place is like, I real if this has got fish on it, that out there has to have fish on it too. And uh, I just fished my way all the way out to it. And I got out, I went through that little cut through area. And then I got out to the mouth. And wherever I got out to the mouth, I just panned out with a live scope. And wherever I panned out with live scope, I've never seen this many fish on a spot in my entire life. I mean, it was, it was, there was thousands and I'm like, there's no way there's a bass. There's no way. And I picked up a jerk bait. I fired a jerk bait out there, twitched it down about two times. And I found it with live scope and about six of them darted up off the bottom. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And a five pounder ate it. And I'm like, oh wow. You know, like, okay, well that, <laughs> yeah, it's probably luck. So I just kind of panned around and I fired it out there again, twitched it down about four or five times I got about halfway to the boat and another four pounder ate it. I'm like, okay. Like, so then I just started looking around, you know, just, I just kind of scanned the area with live scope, marked it, pulled the troll motor up and left. You know, I, I don't stick around and learn an area. So what I did was I started running the lake looking for things that look just like that because I'm like, well, if they're on that spot, then they've got to be on other places that are similar to that. And uh, I, a uh, quick little side note, my wife called about an hour later. She's like, how's practice going? And I told her, I said, I found the winning spot. 
and she's like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, I, like I, if they stay there and I can catch them, this is the winning spot for sure. Like there's, I think half of the fish on the entire lake is on the spot, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, um, so day three was a very, day three of practice was a very, very, uh, pivotal, uh, turned out to be a pivotal point of, of my practice because I went back to Kissimmee and I spent about half the day looking for more stuff like that. Didn't really find anything. Um, but about <coughs> one o'clock, I'm like, dude, you got to figure something else out. Like you can't just have this one spot. You got to, there's got to be something else that you can fall back on. So I tied on a, just a regular, uh, ribbon tail worm. Uh, but it, it's kind of like an old monster worm, but it's a Berkeley is what it was is power bait. Yeah. King uh, yeah. Oh, oh, power bait or max it? Uh, it was a old, it was a power bait. Power bait. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. A power worm. Power worm. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and, and what I told myself was that I was fishing too fast. You know, I, I just told myself, I said, you're fishing too fast. Like, you're in Florida, slow down, and you'll get some bites. So I tied that worm on, and I just started casting it around, just casting it, you know, whatever was in front of me. And I finally worked my way out. I, I was kind of fishing areas that were still similar to the place where I had found the big water fish, which was out on the main lake and was able to get some current to it. Uh, and, and so I'm fishing that same kind of deal or whatever. And, uh, I threw up, I, I come to a little point of Kissimmee grass and it had pencil reeds, uh, on the point of it. I threw that worm up there, those pencil reeds. And as soon as it, like I threw it right past it, as soon as I got in the middle of it, fish bites, set the hook and it was a 475. And I'm like, okay, like I need to go find pencil <laughs> reeds. Is. Yeah, so, like, if I I need to go, like, this was the first set of pencil reads that I had thrown at the entire practice. And so, hmm. I said, I need to go find more pencil reads. So, I jumped down, fired the motor up, start running down the lake, and I go, oh, there's some right there. Stopped, put the troll motor down. I took my hook off. Uh, I went ahead and took my hook off, uh, put a screw lock on, fired over there, and I think, two casts later i got another bite just i mean good bite and it's just mm, mm, mm. and i'm like oh that's another big one and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. okay yeah and i just went ahead and marked it <laughs> and i i crunk i fired the motor back up and i idled about 200 yards there was another little clump little set of pencil reeds out on the point fired over there and i said i should get a bite about right there bonk and i'm like okay I sat down the whole rest of the practice. I drove the entire lake and I marked every single spot that I found that looked like that. So that's later, whenever, whenever we get into the tournament, I'll tell you why that's so important. I mean, dude, that that's what I love about that is going into it. You did some, uh, some research, but like you didn't, force any preconceived notion like you didn't go into it like oh i saw a youtube video last year this time i gotta look for this and only this and it like gives you those mental blocks of anything else that could be playing i like the openness and just the the fluid decision making based on what you're seeing and what's going on in front of you uh i think that creates for good practices and i like the what you mentioned about I don't want to I don't want to understand an area in practice like I don't want to discover you know basically figure it out, um, and that's one thing I've talked about on the show a few times is I was fortunate enough to be on the phone with Seth Fighter back when he won AOI, and that's the, one of the things he said almost verbatim was I don't want to figure out a lake I want to figure it out on day one day two I want to figure out more each day of the tournament, and that's one thing that struck a chord and that sounds that's ex sounds ex exactly kind of how you like to roll in practice. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It, it, it's, it's, I like to find an area that there's fish, you know, like that's what I want to find. I want to find an area that has a good 
a quality amount of fish just in the general area, whether that be on the south end of the lake, on the north end of the lake, this particular creek. And this could be a huge area. But, you know, like per my first day of practice, and I spent <coughs> another half day of practice on uh, Toho and then some of the other lakes as well. And mm -hmm. I could tell that they just were not fishing good. You know, like they, they weren't fishing bad. I could get bites. But whenever I went to Kissimmee and I got a bite, it was a four plus. You know what I mean? Like it, it yeah. was a good bite. And so that kind of narrowed me down. Like I'm going to Kissimmee, like I'm committing to this uh, and I need to go find a pattern that I can run throughout the lake that, you know, can help me later on down the road, just something different. And, and dude, I'm telling you, I rode that entire lake and there was probably, I'd say like 10 areas maybe that had pencil reeds on the entire lake. Cause I'm riding the lake and I'm like, boy, there's really not much of this, <laughs> you know, like, oh man, I, you know, I was a little worried about it. I'm like, man, if this is really a pattern that's really going on, there's not a lot of this on this lake, <laughs> you know? So, um, was that something yeah. you throughout the tournament, you kind of had to manage, like not overfish it. Was that ever a thing? Um, n no, uh, because, well, on day two, the wind was blowing so hard that 90% of those places that I had marked were blown out by the wind. Got it. Okay. And and on day one, I caught 20 pounds in the first 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then I went and, uh, you know, just started hitting some of that stuff and cold up, you know, a couple of times. So, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I think the, the one of the places that I shook a fish off, I didn't even fish it the entire tournament. <laughs> and I felt like it was like a seven or eight pounder. Uh, and, and I never got to fish it. I never, I, I thought about fishing it on day. Well, I mean, like on day two and three of the tournament, it, it was uh, blown out. And on day one, I didn't want to go burn that fish because I thought I might need it later. So, damn. I mean, that's just, that's just tournament wisdom right there because most folks probably would burn it down on day one when they, when they thought it was a big one. But no, that's yeah. – so let's talk about that. Let's talk about going into day one of the tournament. And when you find all of that, I mean, how do you decide which of those areas you're going to start on? Um, that was a pretty easy decision because, I mean, I knew if I could pull up to that place, uh, it would go down quick. You know, it, it wouldn't take – if they were pulled up on it like they were on it where I found it during practice, like it was going to be just lights out really quick. Uh, the other things that I had found, the other pattern was just kind of a, a one fish here, one fish there kind of deal. And there wasn't a whole lot of it on the lake. Plus the place that I told you about the first little area that I found with another little shell bar inside of the pads was only about a half a mile from that original spot. So I felt like one of those two was going to kind of pan out somewhat where I was going to, I didn't expect, <laughs> I didn't expect to catch what I was going to catch, but I felt like one of those places I could catch a decent limit, you know, fairly quickly. So that was a pretty easy decision uh, to stop on that main area first and then have that little, other deal about half a mile away secondary as well so yeah that that was an easy decision first thing in the morning yeah and i feel and then it sounds like they weren't too far away from each other too so that you could easily kind of make that rotation yeah and and i mean the biggest thing was you know i i had found those two spots that were really close together so i felt comfortable that i was going to be able to get on one of them you know I was hoping anyways, I think I was boat 40, something like that. So, I mean, it wasn't like there was a whole lot of people in front of me, but boy, the whole, the whole ride down there, I'm like, Oh, please don't be anybody on there. <laughs> you know, like, did you deal with anybody else on the same stuff? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so I pulled up on it, you know, it's one of those things you're riding down and you finally can see it in the distance. And you're like, oh, there's nobody there. Oh, my gosh. You know, I can't believe it. 
and uh, I pulled up on it, and I had actually, during practice, caught those fish on jerk bait. So, you know, I, I didn't know any better. I picked up the jerk bait, and I start panning around with live scope, you know, and I'm like, oh, there's one, you know, like, and, and I still hadn't found the fish. I didn't know the area, you know. I didn't know exactly where they were setting up or how. I was just going to fish it out. And so I throw the jerk bait over there, snap it down. I don't know, like second cast or so. That I found a little group of three. One of them fires up there, gets it. It's like a three and a half pounder. Put it in the boat. Start panning around. I found another little group of about six or seven of them. Throw it over there. One eats it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a big one. And it comes off. And I'm like, oh, man, uh, you know, like, gosh. And then, like, I make another cast, and I caught a 475. I'm like, okay. I make another cast, and I lose one. And I'm like, okay, that's two big ones that you've lost. And I started looking on LiveScope, and I had finally kind of got into the sweet spot then, like the real juice of it. And it looked like Tennessee River. I mean, it looked like Tennessee River Ledge. They were just do 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 all the way out my graph oh, for gosh. like 50 feet. And I'm like, these fish will bite something else other than this jerk bait. Like, you know, yeah. like why throw treble hooks wherever you don't have to. Yeah. Get that single hook. Get that <laughs> single hook and let's start putting them in the boat. And, and I had that worm tied on, but I had a, a I want to say I had either an eighth or a three eighths, uh, either an eighth or a quarter. I had either an eighth or a quarter ounce weight on that thing. Cause I was throwing it in that grass and stuff, you know? Right. That was what I had set up to throw in those pencil reeds. And uh, I fired it out there, you know, and it's going down, going down. And it gets down to the bottom, and I kind of drug it. And it's, like, real slow, you know. And I get a bite, set the hook, put the fish in the boat, throw it out there. Didn't get bit, didn't get bit, didn't get bit. And I'm like, I'm not feeling the bottom. You know, like, I'm not, mm. I'm not in contact. So I sat down, I took that off, and I put a half ounce weight on there. Pegged it, just straight power worm with a half ounce weight, fired it out there. It goes, it was seven feet deep, I think, six, six and a half to seven foot deep. Yeah. Hits the bottom. And I mean, I bet you I drug it two times. Bonk. And I mean, it was every cast after that. Just boom, boom, it's boom. Crazy. That big of a change or that small of a change just from weight size. Just, just on the weight. And, and it was just not staying down there. You know, it wasn't staying down there in their face. And, mm. and I could keep contact on the bottom, you know. Plus, I could fish it faster. You know, I could drag it. I, I wasn't having to wait on it to get down there. I was able to, you know, pull it, pull it, pull it. And then wherever it got around the fish, then, of course, they bit. But uh, I think I had close to 15 pounds. And another competitor pulled up and... We talked about it, you know, and he's like, Taylor, this is the winning spot. And I'm like, yeah, I, I know it is. You <laughs> yeah. know? And he's like, well, you know, I'm going to beat you here tomorrow, right? And I'm like, yeah, I know you're going to beat me here tomorrow. And I'm like, all right, dude, like just me and you, though, like we're not letting anybody else come in. Like, it's just going to be me and you. And he's like, all right, deal. And uh, we caught what we caught. Uh, I caught almost 20 pounds. I think he had 18 he had a later boat draw than me, so he didn't have to be back till 5.30. I had to be back at 3.30. <coughs> so I left at like uh, 12 or so, and I went and ran my secondary stuff, the pencil reed deal. Mm -hmm. And I caught a – what did I catch that day on that? I caught, I caught a 6 even and a 4.59 or something like that. So I called up twice on that little secondary deal that I had found. And that pushed me over the mark. That pushed me up to whatever I had, 24 mm -hmm. something, 2410 or something like that. I'm not sure exactly what it was. But uh, he was able to stay on it that afternoon and blitzed him. And mm -hmm. he was, and that was uh, Ron Johnson. And he had 26 something, 2613, something like that, uh, where he came. In. So, uh, yeah, he, he blitzed him that afternoon. So it sounds like later in the day, the better it got. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it wasn't bad in the morning. It, it was pretty <laughs> solid. You know, like I, I lost like a seven pounder. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it wasn't bad. But yeah, it was definitely seemed like the, the bigger fish bit in the afternoon. Wild. 
So going in day two, did you run right back to that area? Kind of run the same pattern, like same milk run? Yep, yep. So uh, day two, uh, of course, Ron beat me there. Uh, we get there. Wind is pounding. I mean, it's foot and a half, two foot waves. And that's good on uh, Lake Erie. Not so good on uh, six foot deep. Uh, yeah. You know, Florida yeah. with uh, grass everywhere. You Fish know. ain't gonna like that too much. They they do not like it at all. And uh, so we fished around, and uh, it just it wasn't happening. You know, you could see the fish; they were just constantly moving. They never set up and were feeding into a feeding position. They were just yep. constantly moving around. <clears throat> so I went to my little secondary deal that I had that was about a half mile down and there was two other competitors fishing that as well. And, and we had, uh, we had talked on day one, like I had went to that secondary area on day one. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was, they weren't on it at the time they were around it, but I pulled up, you know, right on it. They were probably, you know, quarter mile or so on each side or whatever. Well, whenever I pulled up on it, they knew that I had found the, you know, the shell bar or whatever. So both of them came over and we talked and, and I told them, you know, they, I think I caught like a three and a half and threw it back. And they're like, geez, dude, you got a great bag. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, well, what do y'all got? You know? And they're like, well, we got like 14, 15 pounds. And I'm like, okay, well, I just want to be able to come back if I need, you know, that was kind of the agreement with we had. I'm like, all right, like I got a good bag. Like I'll leave. I just want to be able to come back. And they're like, no problem. You know, if you want to come back or you need to come back, you're more than welcome. You know, you, you found it just like we did, you know. So, uh, I, you know, pulled trolling up and left. Well, day two, dude, I couldn't get a bite on my deal out there, you know. So, <coughs> I eased down to that secondary little area. And uh, one of the guys was there, you know, already fishing it. And I pulled up and asked him, you know, hey, you mind if I pull in? He's like, absolutely not. Pull in right here beside me, you know? And so I pulled in beside him and, and he already had five. Uh, I think he had close to 15 pounds already. And, uh, we fished around there for a minute and I, I caught one, uh, not bad one and then lost one. But man, I just, I don't know. It just didn't feel, you know, fishing right beside somebody's not my, my, my <laughs> You know, like I, I don't really heard that, like buddy. <laughs> I mean, I'll do it if I have to do it, you know, but yeah. fun fishing, like, sure. Not yeah. like, yeah. But I mean, if sometimes you have to, you know, mm -hmm. like especially the way the fish were uh, for this particular tournament, I mean, everybody in the top 10 was fishing on top of each other, you know, mm. for the most part. They, there was, they, the fish were just grouped up. <laughs> so, uh, I left that little area and I, I, I went back out to check the main spot one more time and I stopped short. I said, I want to stop short and I want to fish this little canal because it was a little, it was just slightly a little bit calmer. Like it wasn't a lot, but it was slightly calmer in that little ditch. And I stopped probably 200 yards, 150 yards short of the main spot up there. And I put the troll motor down and start fishing the edge of the pads. And I'm just kind of live scoping around and looking. And I started seeing them. And I started seeing the fish again. And I'm like, yeah. oh, my gosh. Like, they just little can I. Uh-oh. 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 I think this is either... It shows my signal being good. So I don't think it's me. But I think Taylor is. I think he lost service. 
he was talking about refinding his fish that had apparently moved. Let me shoot him a text here, see if we can't run it back here. Get him back on here. So I apologize for the dead air here, folks. Give me one second. Yeah, we just lost him. So he's. We're gonna see if he can. He can hop back on. It looks like he might have lost service. That is one thing I'm actually really looking forward to. That we're talking about Florida fishing right now is Hobie just announced their schedule, and this is going to be one of the things we talk about uh, on a coming show. Here is the Hobie BOS schedule for next year, and that is. Hobie is starting their trail out in the Harris chain come February. So I'm excited for that because my parents live two hours from the Harris chain. Um, and I haven't been able to fish it at all. I've, I fished Toho for one day, one day on a media trip. And it was like for maybe two hours. So I'm excited to go down and start my season off in Florida. Uh, I'm excited to learn a Florida fishery. It's either we're going to smoke my butt or we're going to figure something out because I love fishing grass, especially offshore grass. So we're going to figure something out, but either way, I'm looking forward to fishing down in Florida. And this is actually really good. Talk to him, stuff to figure out. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have more conversations with folks. I'm kind of that Florida style, you know, fishing offshore, finding that hard bottom, that sort of thing, knowing what grass to look for, why they set up in it, where they set up in it. I think that could be super important. And it's honestly a really fun conversation because that's my style of fishing. So looking forward to that event on the Harris chain. Um, especially that time of year when they're going to be in all three stages, they're going to be spawning. They're going to be post spawn. Some are going to be pre spawn still. I love to find for that event. I mean, I don't want to get too deep into it, but cause we got a long ways away still, but uh, basically I'm looking forward to trying to find an area when we get to that event that has pre spawners and post spawners coming to me. Some leaving some going, but also be able to go later up in the day go try to find uh, some spawners, some big ones on bed. But I think we got Taylor joining it back in here. Let's see if we can get him in. You got us? Yeah, I don't know what happened. It was just like zero service, and I had to jump on Buffalo Wild Wings uh, Wi-Fi. Luckily, Buffalo Wild Wings, shout out Buffalo Wild Wings for having Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's, so, you like, you like for folks, yes, obviously he's in his truck, but, like, you haven't moved. Like, why did it just oh, I know. I don't know what happened. It was just like, it just said zero service. Goodbye. <laughs> that that is that's wild. <laughs> I, don't know. I thought it was me for a second. I'm sitting there, I'm, like, I'm looking at my Wi Fi. I'm looking, I'm like, I'm like, I know we're getting a lot of snow. I'm like, dang, I didn't think it would drop uh -oh. this quick, but <laughs> uh, it started cutting out a needle. I'm like, oh, that's odd. I'm like, because you've been perfect the whole time. Like, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So, where were we? What was uh, you were talking about refinding your fish okay. uh, in a canal. Yep. All right. So, uh, I stopped short on that area and uh, started seeing them on live scope. And finished out my limit and then uh, caught a decent one. And I just couldn't get them to react. I, I tried some different baits and, and they weren't set up really well. But this was also in that period. This was probably getting closer to that 11 o'clock period where they were uh, getting broke up and, uh, and, and kind of quitting that, that bite. So uh, I think I just... I think on day one, if I would have went in that ditch early, uh, I probably could have capitalized a little better. But in hindsight, it really worked out for the better because nobody else knew that they were there, except for me, yeah. because I could see them. Uh, you know, because I had other competitors fishing around as well. So day two is like scramble, scramble mode. I, I went running around the lake. I was on live uh, and just struggling, man. I think I had like 11 pounds or something. And every place that I had marched. So remember we talked about during practice, I rode around and marked all these little pencil reeds, little patches. Well, I fished like six of them, five of them. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the waves were just crashing on them and the pencil reeds are just waving around all over the place. Hmm. And for what, whatever reason, those fish do not like that down there in Florida. 
if that wind's blowing and the grass is waving around, it's just, and I could be wrong. Somebody from Florida could tell me that I'm a flat out liar, but uh, <laughs> in my personal experiences, that's just never been good. It, like you just, you don't get as many bites whenever it's doing that. <clears throat> so I made a loop around this big Island and kind of down the South end of the lake. Yep. Uh, I went to the other side of the lake. I fished stuff that I've never fished before. Things that I had never seen before. Just, just fishing, man. Just by the seat of my pants. And I made a loop down and I come back about 1.30 back to that little area in that ditch. Pulled up in there and I could see them. And I told my cameraman, I said, dude, I can see them. I, like, they're here, but I just can't get them to bite. And, uh, I sat down and I, I start digging on my map. I'm like, I got to make something happen. Like some, I got to, I got to get off this 12 pounds. Like if I get off this 12 pounds, it's over, you know, if I don't, it's over. And I start digging on my map and I see one mark that I had dropped. I dropped an X on the very Northeast corner of the lake. And uh, that's the direction that the wind was blowing out of. And I saw that mark and I'm like, Oh, I remember that. That was a nice little deep edge with some pencil reeds mixed in. And I'm like, dude, I, that's where I need to go. I ran all the way across the lake, all the way to the north end of the lake. Shut down. It was like 2 o'clock. Live goes off at 2 o'clock. Cameraman's like, all right, it's time to make it happen. Live's off. And I kid you not, five minutes later, I caught a five-pounder. Oh, my gosh. Like, I'm like, it's okay. Yeah. So I was like, all right, you know, that, you know, we just saved our day, you know, I, and, you know, just, it wasn't a great bag, but we had saved our day. I called a 12 incher. <coughs> I called a 12 inch. It probably didn't even weigh a pound. It was probably like 10 ounces uh, is how much that fish weighed. And I called it with a five pounder. And uh, I just kind of put my head down and I just kept fishing down this little section you know this this section of the lake that was calm i'd never fished it in my entire life just fishing what looked right and what felt right and i got to a little section where the cassini grass had kind of clumped up for whatever reason it was all clumped up i hadn't fished anything like it the whole week and uh i picked up a one ounce weight flipping weight and started flipping that cassini grass where it was clumped up and uh, caught a four pounder, pumped me up to seventeen something, and saved my entire tournament. So That's just, awesome. just fishing with instinct, man. Just you know, seeing something. And I told my cameraman the whole time, like I had to sit down. I pulled that flipping rod out, and I told my cameraman, I said, "This looks right. Like it just looks right. It feels yeah. right." And sure enough, I mean, ten minutes after I said that, I catch a four pounder. You know, so uh yeah, go figure. It, yeah, I mean it's just it's just one of those things, dude, where you're firing on all cylinders, you know, and you're connected, it, it just it, it happens. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and whenever you're second guessing yourself, when you're second guessing yourself and you're going, Well, maybe I should go do this or maybe I should go do that. Well, I really don't know. And then by twelve o'clock you're so spun out that you sit down at four o'clock where you get back to the truck and you're like, Man, what did I even do for the last four hours? Yeah. No, well, that's when you're in trouble. Especially when you're when you're not thinking of what you should be doing and trying to go to instinct. It's more when you're in that mindset of what should be going on in terms of like you think about the textbook or you think about what's relevant for that lake. And I think that's where a lot of good anglers get really spun out is when they go to brand new lakes and they get to or it's a different tournament, they start thinking more of what they see on YouTube or what they hear about through the tournament circuits and not fishing the way that they should fish and fishing the moment, essentially to think what you should be doing and what should work. Right. Uh, more of like that doc talk. Some people think about if you can get out of that and just more like what you're talking about, <laughs> like just wake up, look around you, see what's going on and just use your fishing senses and you'll be fine. That's yeah. basically what you're trying to get at. But I want to take a second here to <laughs> put out a, um, not really an emergency alert, but like breaking news essentially. Um, we now have, we're in a blizzard right now. Um, and there's also thunder and lightning. Andy confirmed it. We have thunder, lightning, and a blizzard. That is Buffalo for you folks. 
Uh, he's gonna he's gonna try to get a video, and if we can get a video of it, we'll put it on the Serious Angler social because that's wild. I don't yeah. I've never seen lightning and her thunder in a blizzard. Um, what is it? There's an old wives' tale or something that uh, in like in the south, if it uh thunders in december it'll snow 30 days later or something like that i don't know what it is i got a friend that like he would keep up with yeah he would keep up with it on a calendar and like he would always be within like three days two or three days dude that's weird (laughs) he he would he'd be like it's gonna snow on you know january whatever and i'm like how you know he's like because it thundered on december whatever i'm like you're nuts (laughs) That's wild. Yeah. Well, Andy's like our, you know, I was talking about him being a <laughs> tackle tinker early on the show, but he's also like our personal meteorologist because he's way more accurate than the weather apps are for whatever reason. I don't know what it is, but I trust Andy's <laughs> Andy's predictions way more than I trust the uh, the weather apps on my phone. So if he says that it's, he's like, yeah, I literally looked outside, got a flash of lightning, heard thunder for 20 seconds as like he has half a foot of snow pounding on his, on his truck. <laughs> so I'm like, what is going on in Buffalo right now? Man. I think what happened is we had a blizzard and they moved the Bills game to Detroit. So now Mother Nature's angry because she doesn't get a Bills game in Buffalo this weekend. I heard that. So, yeah, that's, that's definitely <laughs> what it is. <laughs> but sorry, let's, let's carry on. So the you know, making decisions, fishing the moment, um, kind of kind of wrap us up on how the tournament capped off and – you know, the remaining of day three. So, yeah. So, uh, day two, we saved our tournament. Day three, uh, I had a game plan. You know, uh, day three, I'm going out uh, number two. So, in the MPFL, uh, you are rewarded for doing well. Uh, day three of our tournaments, first place goes out first, and mm. first place comes back last. So, you get a super long day. You, you go oh, out. Wow, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, you get like 11 hours to fish or something. It, it's crazy. We we don't have to be back till 530. In that. So if you, I mean, if you lose that, it's like you had enough time to put something together. Yeah. <laughs> something together. Yeah, I mean, kind of, pretty much, you know, like you got plenty of time. So, and, and uh, you know, of course, like, I guess the top, 15 or whatever all come back at 5 30 you know so everybody in that top field gets the same amount of time Mm -hmm. uh but anyway so i go i'm going out number two i knew i was gonna be the first one there so my game plan was was to stop on that main area and just have my boat pointed at that ditch and live scope on my way to that ditch because i didn't want to miss anything like, if they had mm-hmm. repositioned out on the point, the wind had laid down. It was much calmer on day three. <coughs> it had actually shifted to the east, and there was an island that was blocking it. So I looked at the weather the night before, and I, I told my wife, I said, we're, we're going to be good because that the wind's going to shift to the east, and that island's going to block it, and uh, it, it's going to be calm right there where we're at. So uh, I stopped on the point. I start live scoping around. Same thing as day two. I mean, there's fish out there, but they're just, dude, they're trucking it. I mean, they're just going all over the place. Like you'd pick one up on live scope and you'd start following him. And he was just like, I could just constantly move my troll motor. Just and like, I would, and I'd be like, dang it. You know, like I'd try and lead them and all that stuff, you know, to throw at them. Right. And I'd pick another one up and he would just, and I got to notice and I'm like, they're all going the same direction. You know, like, why are they all going the same direction? They're all going from left to right. And I got thing, and I'm like, they're all going to that ditch. And I'm like, mm. you, you got to get in, you know, like, and I just fished my way to it, you know. And, and I probably spent maybe five minutes out there on mm. the main deal. And I, I put my nose in that ditch, and wherever I did, I, I, I turned around to my cameraman, and I said, dude, there they are, and we're fixing to light them up. And he goes, you're live and i made a cast and it never hit bottom and i mean it was just if if you guys have not watched it like you got to go to youtube go to uh the national professional fishing league the m uh i think it's uh npfl is what it's called on youtube uh their youtube channel but I'll pull it up here and uh, i'll link it down 
in the description for folks. I'll even it, put a timestamp for everybody to start at. Yeah, it it, it is uh it is like the most unbelievable thirty-five to forty minutes of fishing that I've ever had in my entire life. It, it, it was it was wild. I mean, I caught twenty. I probably had close to twenty-five pounds and lost a ten-pounder in twenty-five minutes, thirty minutes. It was crazy, but uh, man, it, it went down. I mean, it it was awesome. Uh, if you scan through and just kind of look <coughs> somewhere after, whenever it calmed down a little bit and things got a little slower. Uh, I actually turned my live scope on uh, the screen on the back and the cameraman got a great shot of it. Exactly what I was looking at. Uh, you could see the, the, the lily pads there and then mm -hmm. you could see the groups of fish out in front of the lily pads. And I mean, I, I was making pinpoint cast of those fish. I mean, I would have caught a good bag without live scope. Uh, I feel like, but I caught a great bag because of live scope because i was able to uh be 95 percent you know efficient that i was cast into a fish every cast you know instead yeah. of just kind of fan casting around i was able to just locate them and and you know 90 percent of my casts were dead on a fish's nose and if there was ever three like if there was ever three or more it was almost guaranteed like it was almost guaranteed that I was going to get a bite it's, out of just percentages or do you think it was just competition competition just you know if there was three or more there like they they were afraid the other one was going to get it and they couldn't stand it you know <laughs> I, love, it, I love how petty a bass can be <laughs> yeah it, it was uh it was just a matter of if it was going to be a three pounder or a seven pounder you yeah. know I didn't know so that's awesome yeah heck yeah well I mean dude the the bite it sounds like you're on is one just awesome because when you say it's just every single cast that's sick, but also like there's something special and more like I think satisfying about doing it in a derb. Yeah. <laughs> when you know it's going down, you're like, Yeah, we got this in the bag. Hand us the check. As long as the boat has gas, we make it back, hand us the check. <laughs> yeah. I actually uh man, I, I kind of pushed it. I didn't really push it. I I ended up being 30 minutes early, but uh I was blocked by that island. And I told my cameraman, I said, dude, at two o'clock, like these fish are going to pull back in here. And I think I had like 24 pounds or something like that. 25, maybe I probably had 25. <coughs> and I told my cameraman, I said, they're going to pull back in here at two o'clock. And I said, we're going to call up again. Well, I ended up calling up. I caught another six pounder at like three something, like three fifteen, something like that. And then I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm at like, I'm getting close. Like I'm getting close to that 30 pound bag, you know, like <coughs> we just need a giant. That dirty. Yeah. And I had already lost the one that morning. I like, I lost a giant one that morning, but, uh, you know, we, I'm still fishing around, fishing around. Well, it, like my, my time to leave was like 350 or something like that. I'm like, I'm going to leave at 350. That'll give me. You know, I didn't have to be back till uh, five thirty, but I had to run all the way up uh, <coughs> through two other lakes, get into a lock, and then go, you know, up through Toho all the way through Toho to get back to the ramp. So I wanted to make sure that I gave myself plenty of time to do all that. Well, dude, I caught another six pounder at like three forty-five, and I'm like, oh man, they're starting to bite, you know, like, and I'm yeah. seeing them on the graph and. I'm like, ah, I'll fish a little bit longer. Well, I fished till uh, 410. Fished till 410. I'm like, all right, we got to go. Like, let's go. <laughs> Pull the troll motor up. Dude, I got out from behind that island. It was like three footers out there. I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> I have messed up, you know. But, mm -hmm. man, luckily, uh, I had plenty of time. Uh, I got up, uh, got up to the lock, locked through. And I thought Toho was going to be really, really rough as well. But uh, for whatever reason, Toho was like pretty well slick. And uh, we were just able to cruise it on back. So, uh, awesome. yeah, lesson learned. Don't push it. Don't push it. Where you, you got 28 pounds in the boat. Don't push it. <laughs> yeah. Did you know you had it in the bag? Um, No, I didn't know I had it in the bag because there was another 28 pound bag caught the day before, you know. Mm. 
and I knew that the leader was fishing in that same area. Uh, I knew that they were kind of sharing a, an area together. Uh, I didn't know where it was or what, you know, I just kind of knew that they were rooming buddies and all that stuff, you know, and that they were sharing some water. But, uh, so always a possibility. I, if, yeah. There was a possibility that he could have caught 30 and beat me, you know? Right. So, uh, you know, but I, I knew that, I knew that I made him work for it and that that's all I can ask for. You know, that's all you can ask for is just make sure that you go do your job and then everybody else has got to go do their job to beat you. So, yeah. Well, dude, that's awesome. And it's sick just to drop a bag on the last day too to, <coughs> to bring it home. There ain't, there isn't a better feeling in tournament fishing than dropping a big old bag on the scales. Yeah. That's yeah, so sick. Um, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to go through, and find for the folks I'm going to put to the minute, basically when you should start watching till, you know, basically what happened with you. Um, dude, that's sick. Uh, and I think it's, it's sick because it put you officially as like the winningest angler thus far in the NPFL, which it's got to feel good, uh, yeah. because there's a good group of hammers on that trail. Um, but dude, I mean, talk about that really fast because I want to talk about Omega quick. Um, and then before we wrap up, uh, we're going to go for a little bit longer, but, um, want to know, like, w- are there any consistencies between your three different wins and your success thus far on MPFL? Um, yes, because I, I think the last two wins and, and this year I have kind of developed my own, way of practicing and I've developed a way to use live scope to fit me. So John Sokup and all these guys are using live scope and catching suspended fish. Well, I've kind of developed a way to use live scope to kind of fit my, I guess you would call like, what would you call it? Like, uh, I, I, I like shallow fishing. I like uh, flipping and pitching. I like throwing a spinnerbait. I like doing things like that. That's how I like fishing. And, and I've, uh, you know, kind of developed this to help me in that that way of fishing. Uh, and, and it's working. You know, it's working for me. I, I didn't let the live scope change the way that I fished. I adapted it to help me. Um, and... I don't always catch them on it like like I did at this tournament, but it might contribute to one fish or mm-hmm. two fish a day. Even if it contributes to one fish a day, that's one fish that you weren't going to catch. Right. You know what I mean? So uh, uh, I think it's super important for what we're doing. Uh, even guys that are just out there fun fishing like, dude, it's fun. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a blast when you can watch them, you know, it's, it's kind of like sight fishing, but you know, but not, but, uh, yeah. And, and I guess the, the main thing is, uh, for two of them, how I practiced. So I practiced for two of them to win. Like I practiced this tournament wherever I left the house. I told my wife, I said, I am going to win this tournament. Like there is no, second third place like if i'm gonna win angler of the year i have to go win this tournament that's all there is to it you know and i still didn't win angler of the year but if you know gary would have slipped like i did everything i could do to win i did not leave anything on the table and uh when i went to grand i had cut a check in every event i knew i was going to make the championship and i specifically went and practiced grand to win you know, and, and I found the fish, uh, I found them on a completely different bait than I caught them on during the tournament. Uh, where I found those fish, I found them on a top water. They would not touch a top water during the tournament. And I just kind of rotated through the area and started catching them on a jig, you know? And, uh, that was one of those things like, uh, don't get too locked in, you know, like those fish were still there. I just had to figure out how to make them bite, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, so, so don't get too locked in on any one thing and, uh, just kind of let the fish tell you 
what what to do. I love that. Yeah, there's some definitely some good snippets in it, and I I hope folks listening and watching paid close attention. So especially from a mental standpoint, the way you routed the practice and routed each day from making that adjustment versus staying hard headed and fishing what's been working. Whereas I mean, being able to see that those fish are leaving and knowing where they're going, be able to follow them. That's, that's pretty dang impressive. That's awesome. That, well, yeah. that, congrats that, again, dude. That was fun. That was, that was a fun part of like, because it, it's fun when it works out when you're like, right. <laughs> you got this feeling like, man, I feel like I know where they're going, you know, and then you ease over there and you're like, yeah, but even then I couldn't get them to bite on day two, but then day three, it just, it was just lights out, you know, it was like, I am a genius. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the next tournament, I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. Why am I so stupid? <laughs> yeah. You get on those bends where it's like, dang, like I can't do anything wrong. Every fish yeah. is staying on. And then you hit that one tournament or that one, you know, sequence of events where it's like every fish comes off, everything goes wrong. Like your line, like your line gets wrapped around stupid stuff and that just starts making you mad. And then it's like your head just starts spinning. You just get that nice slice of humble pie that brings you back down to earth. That, yeah. That the, that's what I like to call Lake Hartwell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'll happen. Yeah, oh, man. I finished like 60 something, 70 something. It cost me AOI and everything. And it was like, oh, man, if I could have that tournament back so bad. And and so in that tournament, that was a huge eye opener to me. Uh for this year and i needed it like i needed it really bad uh dude i let doc talk get in the way of what i like to do and i was out there fishing for herring fish and i've never fished for herring fish in my entire life i've never fished a herring lake and hmm. i'm out there throwing a you know everybody's like oh you throw a whatever top water and you throw a fluke and but you don't work a fluke like you normally work a fluke. You got to like sweep your rod and all this crap. I'm out there doing all this dumb stuff. And then the guys are going up there and finishing in the top 10 and won the tournament sight fishing. And I'm out there throwing a stinking fluke. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, and, and, but I needed it, dude. Like I needed it. Whenever I got done with that tournament, I was pissed off and mad. And I'm like, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not going to say never, but, I'm not going to do that anymore. Like I'm going to go fish my own deal, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's why it's so important to, I, I mean, if you're a great herring fisherman, well, of course go fish for them. But if yeah. you're a shallow water, largemouth dude, like go try and find some shallow water, largemouth, you know? Yeah. Fish your strengths. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Well, dude, um, we're going to wrap up here in a minute. I got one last question for you uh, to wrap up the show. But before we get to that last question, let's talk about uh, Omega. Tell a little yeah. bit about like your acquisition there, but then also what the brand's all about. Maybe some things you got coming, whatever you want the folks to know. So uh, in July, I was fortunate enough to purchase Omega Custom Tackle. Uh, if you don't know what Omega Custom Tackle is, uh, back oh i don't even want to say what year it was in the early 2000s uh Derek Rimmitz was sponsored by omega and kind of put omega on the map with the football jig and a lot of people throughout the country have thrown an omega football jig but it's been a long time you know like it's been a long time since they've picked up one of our baits and 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 thrown it and we've still got the same great baits that we've always had uh, we've added a few things to the product line. Uh, I haven't personally added anything myself yet. Like I said, I just purchased it in July, but I do have some things in the works um, I'm, that, that I'm working on and got some people that I'm trying to work with. And uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's a slow process. It's not a, you know, overnight kind of deal, but anything great is uh not going to be overnight so uh we're taking our time uh the economy is kind of eh, right now you know so i don't want to go too deep like 
we're going to start adding one or two things here and there and kind of let things progress. You know, uh, we do have some apparel coming. I've got some shirts, new shirts, hats, stuff like that should be going on the website first of next week, something like that. Uh, they're at my house and my wife's mad at me because I've been in <laughs> Illinois deer hunting and we need to be getting apparel on the website. But uh, <laughs> priorities, you know, man, come on, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> shoot one first. Priorities got to get that tag filled uh, before we get apparel online and uh, make money. But uh, that's right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I you know I would very very much so appreciate it if uh, you guys would jump on the website omegacustomtackle.com dot com and just check our stuff out, man. Give us a chance. You know, uh, we're 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 trying to evolve. There's some things that I want to change. There's some things that I want to improve and. Uh, and we'll work through all those things, but yeah, y'all just, uh, give us a chance. I appreciate it. And give us a follow on, uh, Instagram and Facebook, uh, Omega Custom Tackle. I mean, that, that means the world to us. Just give us a follow and follow along and join us for the journey. Heck yeah. Well, I will drop a link if anybody wants to check them out. I'll drop social links and website to Omega down below. So you guys can go check it out and scoop some if you want. And obviously you guys can reach out to Taylor, all of Taylor's social media and everything. I will drop down below as well. So you guys can give a, give a look, give them a follow. I highly recommend it. Uh, you can learn uh, a lot more than what you learned from them tonight. But uh, beyond that, Taylor, anything else you want the folks to know before we hit you with our last question of the night? Yeah, man. Uh, Y'all check out Bass Boat Electronics. Uh, if you go and watch that uh, YouTube video, scroll through. I, I don't know exactly the time mark or whatever. Uh, maybe you could find it. But if you'll scroll scroll through, you'll see me get down to the back of the boat and I turn on my back unit. Uh, check out that unit. That That's what Bass Boat Electronics can do for you, man. They, they've got my stuff dialed in. I mean, it's unbelievable. And... And they're online, and, and you can call them. They've got a tech support line. You can call them and ask questions. Or if you need help rigging something or you've got a question about something, what unit should I use with this? Or, you know, what batteries should I use? Or any kind of questions like that, feel free to call them. they got a tech support line, or you can look them up online, send them an email, however you'd like to do it. And, uh, man, the, those guys there are just absolutely phenomenal. Heck, yeah. Check it out, folks. Well, uh, Taylor, last question of the night for everybody that's new to the show. I'm sure you know exactly what's coming. So maybe, maybe you took time to prepare. Who knows? Um, but if you could sit down and have a beer with three different individuals, they do not have to be the fishing industry. They do not have to be alive currently. They could be alive a thousand years ago. doesn't matter. Uh, three different people. Steak and a beer, sit down, pick their brain. Who are you going to invite? Oh, man, I was not prepared. Uh, uh, man, one of them would be my grandpa for sure. So my grandpa, yeah. my grandpa passed away whenever I was eight years old. And uh, he, you know, got me to catch my first fish. And he used to... Uh, when he retired, he would jump in a camper and drive to Canada every year. And uh, he would he would tell my mom, my mom would say, when are you coming back? And he said, wherever the snow comes or wherever the ice comes, I'm coming back. He spent his entire summers whenever he retired in Canada in a camper and uh, fishing for pike and smallmouth and largemouth. That's awesome. And, and that's what he did. And I would love to hear some of those stories. Uh, yeah, that'd be sweet. That, that would be awesome. Um, so somebody else would have to be, gosh, man, I don't know. Uh, somebody... yeah, like a childhood hero or something like that. Maybe some sport. Chip, folk. Chip, Chipper Jones. I'd like to go Chipper hunting Jones. with Chipper Jones. I don't, I don't, I don't have to have a beer. I don't have to have a steak. I'd like to go hunting with Chipper Jones. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. He's got a show called Major League Bow Hunter, and it's pretty sweet. Like, <laughs> I'd like to go do that. Hey, I got to connect. I can link you up. <laughs> oh, hey, let's do it. There you go. Um, And then, uh, 
man, I'd have to have somebody fishing related, uh, maybe like Denny Brower or somebody like that would be awesome. Godfather yeah. of all flippers. That's right. I yeah. do love flipping. I love flipping. I love pitching. I love skipping. And, uh, that'd be awesome. Denny Brower. Heck yeah. That's a, that's a power three. That's solid. Isn't it? I'm, yeah. I, I'd be pretty happy. That'd be a, <laughs> that'd be an epic, <laughs> epic night. That'd be for sure. Yeah, it'd be a great steak, I'm sure, and uh, probably some fast <laughs> flowing beers, I would imagine. So I might need to bring us bring some extras. But um, for real, thank you so much for uh, taking time out tonight. I learned a lot. Uh, I'm excited. I told the folks when we had some technical difficulties earlier that uh, my season already for 2023 is going to kick off in Harris Chain down in February. Uh, so it's been cool to hear how. This offshore bite kind of sets up because Florida obviously is very daunting to a lot of people. Um, so it's one I probably could pick your brain more on just like how you even find this stuff. We have to get you back on the show and kind of do more of like when you look at a lake in Florida, how do you even go about trying to find offshore stuff? Because I mean, for folks that haven't looked at a map of Florida lakes, there there isn't quite a, quite contours. Like you, you're not going to be looking no. at it and be like, oh, there's a hump right there. No, you don't exactly get that. So. Uh, that would be a cool show, uh, especially from an electronic standpoint. It sounds like you're pretty dialed. So that'd be that'd be pretty cool. But for real, thank you for taking the time out. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, man, we'll be talking to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Bailey. I appreciate it, man. Heck, yeah. We'll chat with you. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Well, folks, hope you guys enjoyed that show. That was a lot of fun talking to Florida. Uh, talk about dominance. I mean, most winningest angler in NPFL. As of right now, uh, won the tournament, ended on a 28-pound bag. That is kind of what every tournament angler dreams of doing, especially on a final day for a big old check, dropping a big old bag on the scales and being like, yeah, hand me that trophy. Uh, that is always awesome, especially to watch, but also it's way more awesome, I'm sure, for Taylor getting the trophy and obviously the check. But I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure you guys go and click on the links below. Watch his frenzy. I'm going to drop that down below, uh, that link to the NPFL's YouTube, as well as Taylor's social media. Highly encourage you guys to go follow along, as well as links to Omega as well, the company that he is now running. And if Taylor's running that, that means there's good things coming for that brand. So I highly recommend you keep an eye out uh, for some changes, as well as just go check out what they currently have in stock. Um, beyond that, we, I just got a notification on my phone uh, beyond just Andy seeing a thunderstorm slash lightning slash blizzard at the same time in Buffalo. I got a notification. We are now Buffalo uh, for Erie County is on a driving ban as of right now. So my plans in the morning to go fishing might not happen. I might just play the ignorant route and just do it anyway until I get stopped. But uh, we'll, we'll, fi we'll figure it out <laughs> in the morning. Uh, hopefully that driving ban list, because we, we should have for what we pay and dang taxes up here in New York for our plows. They should be going to work tonight. Um, but hopefully we get to go and film a fun blizzard, smallmouth kayak video tomorrow, but we'll see that's up in the air. Uh, and again, shows next week, Thanksgiving show next Tuesday evening with Kevin Baxter, Mr. Bateman, uh, that's going to be next Tuesday evening, a dual live stream. Look out for that. And as well as Cody Milton and Drew Gregory for next Friday. But as always, folks, appreciate you guys. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>